was just a little more than a year ago that a Macintosh was still something you gave to your teacher. But today there are hundreds of thousands of Macintosh computer owners, and the Mac even gets its own computer show here in San Francisco. Is the Macintosh the computer for the rest of us? And who are the rest of us? We'll find out next as we take an in-depth look at the Macintosh on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Chronicles is brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. This is Gary Kildall, and this little guy is the star of our show today. There's a pun there, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> Uh, the Macintosh has certainly been a big success by any measure, Gary, and we're going to be talking about the Macintosh today. It's interesting, though, in that the, the Mac didn't really represent technological innovation so much as an innovative use of graphics, certainly, and a user-friendly user interface. So the story of the Mac really is about that, the importance of those two things, isn't it? Well, you know, the style, the Mac-style interface has its origins really in work that was done over 10 years ago, so that's not new. But what the Mac has really brought us is really affordable, high-resolution graphics, and that leads us to a whole new set of generation of software that where pictures and text uh, are both important. In fact, it's really not just the ease of use, but really we're leading to, into applications that just couldn't have been done unless we had the high resolution graphics. Okay, on today's program, we're going to meet some of the original members of the Mac design team. We'll take a look at a piece of innovative software for the Mac called File Vision, and we'll take a look at GEM, a Mac type interface for the non Mac world. Now, when the Macintosh first came out a little over a year ago, the big question was where is the software, and will there be software? Well, the answer now that we're a year into this is certainly yes. Here's a look at what's out there. In the short history of personal computing, there has never been such a dazzling campaign. In less than a year, the Macintosh was transformed into an instant myth, bigger than life, and a brash challenger to its arch nemesis, IBM. But a computer's success depends on more than showbiz magic, and the most repeated question concerns software. At the Mac's introduction, there were all of two programs available, MacWrite and MacPaint. Since then, in fact, the number of Mac products has skyrocketed, and now numbers in the hundreds. From word processors, to games, to databases, to video digitizers, a profusion of new programs has come out, many of them relying heavily on graphics. No fewer than three video interfaces are available for transferring live images, still photos, or a direct video feed. Once the image is captured in the memory, you can get a black and white printout. Getting a jump on Lotus's eagerly awaited jazz is a multitasking package called Ensemble from Hayden Software. It is a good example of the special approach many suppliers are taking in designing software for the Macintosh using pictures instead of words. An item called Mac Prompter puts the Mac's versatile font library to work, allowing the user to make changes in style, size, and speed instantaneously. On the hardware side, there are variations on the mouse idea like an oversized trackball for users who tire of the space-hungry mouse that came with their machine. It's hard to say whether the third-party software is going in the business-like direction Apple seems to want. At this Mac show, there were at least as many fun-oriented programs as business-oriented ones, but that may just reflect the versatility rather than the limitations of the Macintosh. Joining us now is Bob Foster. Bob is Vice President for Marketing at Telos Software, the makers of File Vision. And next to Bob is Joanna Hoffman. Joanna was part of the original Mac design team, and she's now in charge of product marketing for the Macintosh. Stuart, we're at a point now in the industry where we have processors like the Motorola 68000, Intel 286, a half a mega memory is sort of standard, and we have high resolution, high resolution graphics like the Macintosh. And it leads us to a whole new level of software where uh, graphics is a very, very important part of the, part of the application. Joanna, what, what, did, what kind of vision did your group have in terms of the new applications you'd see on the Mac? 
Well, we knew that what we were creating was basically the clay from which um, everything else was going to spring. We were creating the raw materials for people to be able to build on top of and make phenomenal applications in the future. If you think about the history and if you look at the Apple II, for example, we couldn't have conceived of having products like VisiCalc or mm -hmm. uh, Apple Works or things like that uh, running on this little machine. So you felt like basically you were creating a tool and you weren't really sure where this tool was going to lead. Well, we knew it was going to lead into, into uh, probably the next generation of mm -hmm. software, but uh, we didn't know to what extent, for example, uh, and to how quickly these things would come along. And for example, file vision mm -hmm. was something that we couldn't have possibly right. predicted. What we were hoping to do is provide enough tools in terms of very easy user interfaces, well-defined, built into the system so that all software developers had the tools at their fingertips. The whole point of the machine was to make it not only extremely powerful and useful, but also extremely easy to use. Now these applications that we're talking about that are really uh, use graphics where uh, we couldn't have used graphics before. You brought one example with you here. Uh, can you show us what that's about? Yes, this is uh, a Macintosh project, for example. Anybody who has uh, done project planning realizes that there are many, many components to planning out a project, and uh, it really helps to see everything visually graphed out and, and put in front of you. Um, sometimes if you walk into a corporation's planning headquarters, for example, you will see walls strewn with paper mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, project plans all over them. Um, on Mac project, you can do it directly on the screen. For example, here we have a development project being planned out uh, with all the resources and the scheduling and you can easily see the progression of the project what's in the way um, all the milestones are sketched out if I for example want to go and say oh well, this becomes an, a major milestone I can go and easily change that to, uh, to a milestone um, right here and now uh, the, the project knows that this is something that absolutely has to take place before before anything else can be completed. Right. And right. so it's very visual mm -hmm. and you can uh, enter things and plan things out and, and see this is a good example again of something that you couldn't do on a let's say a teletype obviously or a teletype or cancer ray to this. Oh absolutely yeah. but also you know there are so many views on the same project for example there's this is another way to look to look at the project and to see how things are going to fall out in the scheduling and so on. Now, this As is very can, graphical and, and, and is nature, and this is the kind of thing we're looking at. Uh, uh, how about Final Vision? Um, yeah, we're kind of in a, in a similar situation uh, as Joanna was saying. Uh, what we were doing is that we had designed a product and we're looking for a machine for it. We knew that we wanted to lead the uh, next generation of software products, and we knew the way to do that was by integrating uh, visual aspects into the software so that it became more intuitive for people to use. And uh, we actually started building file vision over three years ago and uh, the market research that we did for it we brought it up on a prototype on smaller machines uh, just to bring it out into the field and to show it to people and then uh, and we actually sat it on the shelf and uh, waited for a machine to come along that would allow us to do what we wanted to do uh, our background is from mini computers and mainframe computers and we did uh, imaging software uh, for the satellite program and we're aware of of how important uh, images and graphics were to uh, business but there was a luxury that only large businesses could afford well, let's let's take a look again at this approach of here's the, here is the database product mm -hmm. and the most database products have uh, textual orientation you type in a little command a boolean expression that says I like to find this and this or this and as a result of that you might get a paragraph back telling you about a retrieval of some sort now my, my understanding is file vision approaches this from the standpoint of you have pictures and graphics that you'd like mm -hmm. to, uh, to manage in some way yeah exactly <laughs> what we've done is that we've integrated together an object-oriented drawing system and a filing system mm -hmm. such that uh, every object that you have which is normally thought of as, as a file or a record that you kept in your filing cabinet in this case, it's an object that's on a screen, and that object is associated with a record and the data behind that object. Uh, just a second here, we'll have one up for you to, to look at. What is the demo you're going to show us, Bob? Uh, what I'm going to show you here is, this is a map of the United States, and uh, this is a standard demo that we ship with all file vision so people can get a chance to, to practice and to, to work with file vision. And the map of the United States, each of the objects in this uh, database are in fact the states and here they are on the screen such if I touch the state of California you'll notice down here that it tells you that's California you reach over here and if you don't know what that state is turns out it's Colorado it tells you that 
And there's a little info button lit over here, which means it's going to give you the information about that. We're now linking off into the filing portion of file vision. And this is a file form. And this is Colorado, and this is the data that we're keeping behind it. In this case, it's different from uh, other kinds of database systems, and they're very static, and uh, you have to figure out beforehand what you're going to do. Let's Here could you, you show us uh, how, to, how to do a Boolean expression, for example, using file Okay, vision. I'll just um, close this file here. I'll go over to what we call Tinker Menu. Again, we don't want to scare people with phrases like Boolean uh, expressions. <laughs> and uh, instead, you just highlight some, which means that you're going to highlight some of these states based upon the data that's underneath them. Mm -hmm. In this case, I'm going to look at those states that have greater than or equal to 50 computer stores in them. And I say done. Now, this idea is similar from when you go into people's offices. You see that they have maps on the walls with pins in them of different colors. Well, File Vision mm -hmm. obsoletes that. We've now redrawn the map based upon the data that's underneath it, and I can shade them a slightly different shade. And I'll shade them this shade. Okay, the map is now highlighting <clears throat> which states, Bob? The states that have uh, at least 50 computer stores or more. And then if I cancel the highlighting here, I see that we've redrawn the map such that you can quickly view the, the United States map and see which have uh, more than 50 computer stores. Uh, you have some sorts of provi you have provisions in here then that you can build these, uh, build new pictures and store away pictures and categorize them and so forth. Yes, you can build just mm -hmm. literally hundreds and hundreds of pictures. Not only mm -hmm. that, uh, people are out developing file vision files that independent people can buy where they're already, the stuff is already mm -hmm. drawn for you. Right. Well, Bob, that's a very impressive use of the kinds of graphics mm -hmm. and power you were talking about, Gary. In just a moment, we're going to take a look at the Macintosh push into the business and office world, and we're going to, going to meet a man who used pull-down menus before anybody ever heard of a Macintosh. So stay with us. With us now is Lee Lorenzen. Lee was with Xerox when the star system was developed there, and Lee is now a software engineer with Digital Research Incorporated. And next to Lee is Bennett Wiseman. Ben is the Associate Director of the Market Analysis Service at Infocorp. Ben, it seems like the Macintosh was introduced, I guess, as a computer for the home, and then uh, uh, and, and now we're trying to break into the office with the Macintosh. What, what opposition is there going to be? Well, the uh, system has been built to be very easy to use, and very easy to install, and there are some limitations that have been put on that to get those compromises. And the question is really whether the ease of use will get them into the office or whether the limitations will prevent uh, their what acceptance. What kind of limitations? We're talking about limitations. Things like speed of the network, uh, mm -hmm. interfaces to other products. Uh, all of these things have been discussed, and Apple's very aware that they need them, but uh, the market still has to deliver on them. And mm -hmm. I think for business users, particularly larger business users, to be comfortable with what's going on, they'll have to see a lot more hard product and be convinced that Apple's going to give them the kind of support and uh, connection capability that uh, they're going to demand. Now, that may not be the case for smaller businesses where the attractiveness of the package and uh, things like the laser writer will make it very useful immediately for them, and they won't have concerns about how does this link to my IBM right. mainframe. Mm -hmm. Ben, in, in your report to your clients on this, you, you made an interesting comment that for Apple to succeed here with the Mac office, they have to kind of tone down their hype. What did you mean by that? Well, business users as opposed to home users tend to be extremely conservative, and a lot of the things that are attractive about Macintosh uh, work against the basic policies of a lot of office systems. They don't like openness and lack of control and uh, the ease of proliferation <laughs> of software and products, which is really the fundamental uh, theology behind a product like Macintosh and the Macintosh office. And if the advertising goes in such a way that uh, makes business users feel uncomfortable, uh, as opposed to IBM, who does everything possible to make them feel as supported and as loved as possible. Right, They'll no. run into difficulty. Well, yeah, advertising we're reflects obviously that. trying to uh, break into the other direction with Jim, which is a product that Lee's going to talk about, is from the IBM PC side into uh, taking that kind of a same, same interface and using that. Uh, Lee, can you talk about uh, Jim at all? Sure. I think the best way to talk about it is to actually get a demonstration of the product. As you can see, we're running here on an IBM PC AT. And I'll just pull up a calculator, which is an example of one of the desk accessories that we have. And as you can see, the color is really very vivid with Jim here. I'll go ahead and close that window out, and then we'll go into, this is the Jim desktop, which actually provides a visual look at the filing system, the underlying filing system of DOS, which is, it essentially replaces the A greater than, which is a difficult concept for users to, to uh, use. And let me bring up one of the pictures that we have here with Jim Draw. We'll click on that. and. 
Jim Draw is a, is a graphical drawing package which can be used for drawing things like you're going to see here in a minute, such as a video camera, or also for doing business presentations, uh, the kinds of foils with text that is the predominant part. As you can see here, we have a camera. We can come up here to the edit menu and duplicate that. Important thing here is that now we got two cameras, and we just have to move to this second one and, and drop it down like that. And it's as easy as that to use. The other important concept here is we can take that camera, and it's actually not just a single element as appears on the screen, but many elements. And we can ungroup those elements. You see all the, the various pieces that make so up the camera. So this is a difference between a paint and a draw program, basically, is that a paint program is just like a piece of paper. Once you've painted over, drawn over something, it's gone. And here the individual components and pieces are still available for, for moving or regrouping. That's and right. And we've actually selected one of those objects here, and then we can come over here and give it a color, like so. So we got a red okay, body. So you draw it in black and white, and then you can add the color. Or you could you could have drawn it in color as you're going along, but you can add the color at really any point in the process. Okay, Lee, it, it looks like a kind of color version of a Mac type uh, interface. You're running this now on a PCAT. Is that the kind of machine you need to run, Jim? Well. Jim will run on machines like the PC. It even runs on the PC Junior. Um, it requires 256K of memory and um, obviously some kind of graphic screen to run. However, when you actually get into versions that support the color, it does take a machine more of the horsepower of an, of an AT or a Tandy 2000, that type of machine, to really um, handle the color effectively. Okay, Lee, thanks. Uh, with Mac now moving into the office arena and the business arena, some products have become very important. On the software side, one is Jazz. On the hardware side, as we've heard, the Apple LaserWriter. We have a report. When the developers of Lotus 123 announced that they were working on a similar package for the Macintosh, Apple saw it as a major step forward for the Mac. The idea of a multifunctional software package designed for the graphics environment of their new computer seemed like the ideal project. We've taken some of the ideas and some of the lessons we learned in developing 123 and Symphony, which exists for the IBM and other compatible computers, taken some of those lessons and redesigned a new concept for the Macintosh. Very important to note, though, that we didn't merely carry over the products 123 and Symphony in the Macintosh. We started from scratch. We started from the Macintosh using the unique design capabilities of that machine, especially the graphical user interface. Like 123 and Symphony, Jazz permits the user to keep several files active simultaneously. Database, memo sheet, word processing, and communications work interactively and make extensive use of the Mac's icons and hidden menus. Apple's determination to make its new machine a success led to some unusual partnerships during the Mac's development. If most new machines on the market try to fit themselves to existing software or hope for third-party companies to jump in, Apple courted the major software producers ahead of time. It was sometime around the months of July, if I recall correctly, that Apple first showed us the Macintosh, which they're subsequently going to announce and release in January of 1984. So we were able to see the Macintosh up front, and we made a decision to develop for it because it was so unique. It was so different from what we had seen from other manufacturers. Apple's attempt to anticipate the Mac's early needs did not end with software. The company is taking aim at IBM's office market with a new laser printer. Apple is betting that the laser's high speed, about eight pages a minute, combined with the Mac's lively graphics, will finally give the computer the image they want as a serious business tool from a determined company. Stuart, Jazz is being offered to us as a state-of-the-art product, and I think it'd be interesting to see you know, how we got to this point and where we're going to go to in the future. Well, I think our next guest can help us do that. Larry Tesler has joined us now. Larry worked at Xerox Park. Larry helped develop the Lisa, and he's now the manager of the Future Architecture Group for the Macintosh. Larry, you and others uh, at Xerox Park uh, in the early 70s had a vision about what we're going to see in the 80s, and you hit, looks to me, right on. Um, what were the steps that led us to this kind of a user interface that we're dealing with right now? Well, there was a lot that went into it. It really probably started back in the 60s with uh, Doug Engelbart's NLS group at SRI in, in Menlo Park, where they, they envisioned the uh, coming of office automation and developed a system where actually the first mouse was used. It was a mouse very much like this with three buttons. But they were way ahead of their time, 20 years ahead of their time. Anyway, at Xerox Park, a few people from that group came and joined us. And the main motivation at Park was an understanding that hardware costs were plummeting. And systems with high resolution graphics, which were then at, would cost $100,000 for a reasonable uh, computer-aided design system, 
would be coming down in price to the point where someone could have it in their living room or in their office. This was really incredible at the time. We, we could barely believe the numbers, but there they were. The time the, was when, Larry? This was uh, 1970 is when Park started. I became an employee in 73. There are visions of things like the Dynabook, for example, I guess. Oh, yeah. That uh, was almost a reality now. That's right. Mm -hmm. So we could see very much this sort of thing. And so we had this vision of workstations that had high-resolution bitmap graphics and mice and networks tying them together and laser printers and file servers and just what you see beginning to happen. Uh, people thought it would be coming around 1980. To about the point we are now. So we were a little optimistic, I think, by about five years. Well, what is the, what is the relationship to, between the work that was done at Xerox and the work that took off, say, in Apple with uh, Lisa and the Macintosh? How did that work out? Mm -hmm. Well, what happened was that our research group, group at Park uh, was developing a system called Smalltalk, mm -hmm. which was actually intended for educational users. I also spent part of my time working with a group that was developing systems for business users. So I got involved in both projects. Uh, around 1980, it became pretty clear that uh, Xerox was going to focus their attention entirely on a certain segment of the marketplace with fairly high-end workstations like the Star. Mm -hmm. And my personal interest was in personal computing, and there were a few others at Xerox with a similar interest. So several of us all moved to Apple and uh, brought with us this, these, uh, this inspiration to pursue the small talk work, which was well known in the academic community, but it wasn't really uh, being taken advantage of right. by any okay. manufacturers. That's interesting now that Apple is trying to move into that office automation area. Mm -hmm. Ben, yeah. what, is, uh, what do you think about the Xerox Star? Is that uh, a viable well, it's product? It's still a very much a live product. I don't, not people are aware of its history, but it has gone through five major software revisions. Uh, the pricing has changed quite a bit, and the performance is substantially improved and uh, broadened from what it was before. But its emphasis has been as a business system. So, so it's a, something we just don't really see in this market. Right. What about the future? What are, where is this thing going? What, are we, what kind of things? You, you had a good vision, uh, say, 10 years ago. What's going to happen in the next 10 years as far as this? Well, I think there'll be some improvements still in visual presentation and pointing devices. But I think the main change we'll be seeing is in the area of communications, the ability for uh, information in corporate databases to be downloaded into personal computers and actually usefully processed. The ability for people to prepare routine work to have it done for them by their machine. To have uh, what we call an agent in the machine which represents you in transactions with other individuals. Sounds, sounds like we're going in a lot of good yeah. directions. Gentlemen, <laughs> we're out of time. Thank you. Okay. The Apple Macintosh has received an unheard of kind of notoriety, things like the famous 1984 commercial in the Super Bowl, the Lemmings commercial, which we just saw some time ago. Yet we heard on this program that the whole media hype may be a problem for Apple as it approaches this business market. Our commentator, Paul Schindler, has some thoughts on Apple's media image. The two Macs in this world, the Apple Macintosh and the McDonald's Big Mac, have a lot in common. They're both over-advertised, shiny boxes whose contents disappoint. Now look, I know the people that designed the Apple Macintosh say they meant it to be a business machine from the start. And I know they say there's now hundreds of business software packages available for the Macintosh. But that doesn't convince me. You can call a mouse an elephant for a week if you want. You can even take out full page ads in the paper. In the end, both are going to be gray and both will have tails, but anyone who takes a close look is going to be able to tell the difference. Apple wants the Macintosh to be taken seriously in the office, and I'm sorry, but I just don't think that's ever going to happen. The machine is wonderful, but it's flawed. It's too expensive, it isn't fast enough, and it's in black and white. I just don't get it. Apple used the world's finest technology in the Mac and produced a machine with an entertaining disk drive sound that users spend too much time listening to. It's got a small screen, it's great for graphics, but it's overkill for words and data. I like Apple. I wish them good luck in breaking IBM's hegemony over the personal computer market. I just don't think Mac is the answer. That's my opinion. I'm Paul Schindler. In the random access file this week, reports that AT&T is finally about to come out with its new model 7300, the machine it is betting on in its battle with IBM. 
The PC-7300 will be a Unix-based machine, able to handle multi-users between 4 and 9, depending on the software. The basic 7300 comes with 512K, expandable up to 2 megabytes. It will feature icons, a mouse, and a built-in phone. The 7300 will replace the 6300, which is an IBM compatible. Meanwhile, in Boca Raton, rumors are that IBM will soon be announcing the PC-2, reportedly a lower-cost version of the AT. The PC-2 will essentially replace the PC and the XT. Sources say the new PC-2 could be priced around $1,000. Morrow Computers has announced a new 25-line version of its Pivot portable computer, and to keep sales of the 16-line model going, Morrow has cut the price on the Pivot by a thousand bucks. Current owners can upgrade the original Pivot by paying the extra thousand. Commodore is finally showing its new lap portable. It's got 16 lines by 80 columns, a built-in modem, business software in ROM, and 32K of RAM. It's expected to sell for under $600. And new details coming out on the upcoming Atari 130ST. The basic 128K model will sell for around $400. It will feature DRI's gem user interface with icons, windows, and pull-down menus. And Atari says it will offer a 10 megabyte hard disk for $600. On this week's software review, Paul takes a look at TopView, the new IBM user interface. You know, people can easily do two things at once, like talk on the phone and take notes. But one of the most frustrating things about PCs is that they can only do one thing at a time. Use your modem, forget about your word processor. IBM noticed this, so they came up with a multitasking operating system called TopView. Well, TopView is easy to use, but it's hard to install unless you want to buy all your software from IBM. Now, IBM says you need 256K of memory, two floppies, and no mouse. I say you need more like 512K of memory, a hard disk, and a mouse for sure. Using the cursor keys with top view is like trying to scrub your screen with a toothbrush. Now, no one would say that IBM ignored the color capabilities of the PC when it wrote top view. Here's a few screens of the tutorial which comes with top view. It is by far the easiest way to learn how to use the program. Like everyone else, IBM assumes you'd rather not use DOS, so it provides a DOS helper called DOS Services. Top View's problem? It has to be made aware of your programs. Now, IBM makes this easy for their software and harder for software from elsewhere. As more programs become Top View aware, this problem should go away, making it easier to spend $149 for IBM's Top View. For Random Access, I'm Paul Schindler. The IRS has fouled up again, this time delaying tax refunds due to problems with its new computer system. The feds are about 5 million refunds behind last year's schedule due to installation and training problems associated with its new $100 million computer setup. If you always wanted to run your own computer store, it may be getting easier. Computerland has just announced drastic cuts in the cost of a franchise. It used to be $75,000. You can now get in for $15,000 or less. There's a new entry in the optical scanner market. Oberon International has come up with a low-cost print reader called OmniReader. It scans text and enters it into your computer as a text file. The price is under $500. First, there were magazines for machines, Macworld, PC World, and so on. But now there is a new magazine for one piece of software, Lotus. The new Lotus magazine is due out in a few weeks. It will be a monthly. Lotus says its new magazine will start with a circulation of 300,000. In Florida, the computer has replaced the ball and chain. Palm Beach County law officials are using a computerized radio transmitter strapped to a prisoner's ankle to track prisoners who are serving their sentences out in the community. Any attempt to leave the county or remove the transmitter triggers an alarm on an IBM PC back at headquarters. The world's first computerized restaurant opened this week in Palo Alto. MacArthur Park waiters are now using small, palm-sized computer terminals to enter orders. As the waiter pushes the buttons on the handheld unit, the orders print out at terminals in the kitchen. The new system is made by a startup called Validec. They say computerized ordering will speed up service and enable one waiter to cover more tables. I think I'll tip via home banking. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. See you next time. The Computer Chronicles was brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom.